podcast of Science Matters. The topic for today, really excited about this, exercise, glucose <laughs> consumption, and decreased cancer incidence. No surprise that exercise is an amazing uh, uh, component of, of a healthy lifestyle, uh, but here we really get into some, some nerdy tech, tech stuff that just proves what we've been saying all along. So it's the number one this is number. This is one of a number of studies that are highlighting the importance of ongoing exercise in maintaining metabolic health, with the added feature of decreasing cancer risk and development. It sure is, and as you know, Reed, in each one of these sessions, we're taking a deep dive into recent research, and we're trying to keep it recent. Uh, that brings to light objective scientific evidence and, and that's important and, and these articles by the way are peer-reviewed this is stuff that has been looked at independently i'll keep repeating that this is not a figment of someone's imagination but it's gone through a series of filters doesn't mean it's a hundred percent but it gets pretty close to some pretty decent scientific evidence so today we're going to look more closely at exercise induced metabolic shield in distant organs and how that blocks cancer progression and metastatic dissemination. This study, and there have been numerous others in recent years, has begun to uh, delve into the important role that's being played by exercise in maintaining a healthy homeostatic balance. So let's look at the actual evidence. You know why? Because science matters. So fantastic. Uh, thank you. And um, before we get going, Dr. Gonshore, in last week, our discussion of Alzheimer's disease, the effects of intracerebral fructose and uric acid metabolism, we received several questions, one of which is, and we'll just have time for one today, folks. Uh, but we're talking about having another event where we could answer additional questions. Uh, we'll see what develops in that area. But here's the question, Dr. Gonshore. Given that fructose and uric acid are important factors in the development of Alzheimer's disease, what are some of the other important possible cause, causes of that horrible scourge on society? Sorry, I got a bit of a cold. I'm just going to take a bit of water. There is no sugar and uric acid in that, by the way. Good old water. Uh, remember that for many researchers now, uh, Alzheimer's disease and many other neuro neurodegenerative diseases are considered, believe it or not, as diabetes type 3. That's something that they're calling it now. So it gives you an idea that we're looking at a metabolic issue. However, there were a lot of questions about, well, what about the amyloid beta and tau? What about those proteins? All of this work that's being done and these th these drugs that are coming out well somebody asked the issue the aggregation of tau into these little filamentous inclusions in the brain seems to underlie uh, later stage alzheimer's disease later stage and other numerous neurodegenerative tauopathies as they call them or neuropathies that are caused by the tau protein problems However, the pathogenesis of these tauopathies is really unclear, which is impeding the development of various types of treatments. We're trying to get treatments here at the end of the day. It isn't a game. So there's been a lot of recent analysis of a number of proteins that are called human tripartite motif proteins, TRIM for short, as an acronym. And it's shown that some of these TRIMs, in fact, TRIM double one, could potentially inhibit tau aggregation because you, you don't want tau to increase in the brain because what it's doing, this trim is degrading tau. And so we also know that this particular group of trim, these proteins, is markedly lower in the brains of those with Alzheimer's disease. Interesting. So we know that trim has been shown to help in maintaining the connectivity and viability of neurons. So there's something going on there. These findings therefore suggest that lower levels of trim, if you get lower levels of that, that is contributing 
to the pathogenesis of the tauopathies and re restoring that trend, restoring those proteins and their expression and their ability to degrade tau may represent an effective therapeutic strategy. But remember, and here's the important thing, notwithstanding all of that, these are effects that are occurring later in Alzheimer's disease development. And what we were discussing with fructose and uric acid and that whole metabolic aspect is the early aspects, what's beginning to cause that problem. And the trick is catch it early or prevent it altogether. That's really what you want. If you get it later, sure, of course you want to try to solve the issue. No one's saying no to that. But if you can prevent it, or if you can create lifestyles and metabolic changes that are going to keep this from starting in the first place, that's the way to really approach it. Thank you so much. I mean, that, that really ends on a very positive note because our entire tribe is dedicated to helping people catch it early, whatever it might be, or prevent it, as you said, and uh, live long and healthy lives and prosper, of course. So I want to thank everybody, of course, for submitting your questions. We can't get to them all. And again, we're looking at possibly having another platform, the occasional Facebook Live or something, just to answer questions for our loyal listeners. So uh, they're all important to us as we're learning together. And right before this recording started, Dr. Gonshore and I both talked about how much fun we're having learning. These studies interest us too. Uh, we're not doing this for, for popularity. We're doing this because it's exciting and the amount of new research coming out is just amazing. So we'll try to keep up. And thanks, Dr. Gonshore. Let's jump into today's study about an exercise-induced metabolic shield in distant organs that can block cancer progression and metastatic dissemination. So after you. So does everybody see this? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Excellent. We're going to get the we're going to get the proverbial show on the road. And <clears throat> as I said earlier, we're discussing exercise induced metabolic shield, a shield metabolically in distant organs and how that blocks cancer progression and metastatic dissemination. And I can tell you when I first looked at this, I said, "Really? Well, a lot of truth to it." Big group of people worked on this, and this is the particular study which came out very recently, and their conclusions really are that exercise protects against cancer progression and metastases, and how does it do it? By inducing a very high nutrient demand in internal organs. It's telling organs, we need a lot of energy, give us energy, and it's indicating that reducing nutrient availability to tumor cells, which has long been understood as being an issue, represents a potential strategy to prevent metastatic problems. So what are we looking at here? <clears throat> well, there's, there are two things. First of all, the research shows that in healthy humans, they, they looked at 20 years of data evaluated before and after running very, very high intensity running. This was human data on 3,000 individuals. So they analyze these exercise patterns and they also analyze cancer incidents. So what they looked at first is cancer-free participants. And if there was exercise prior to cancer starting, it had a modest impact on cancer incidents when it actually started and in the low metastatic stages. But it significantly reduced the likelihood of highly metastatic cancer. So that was interesting. They also looked at an animal model. <clears throat> they took mice and they trained them on a very, very strict exercise routine, very high exercise. And they sampled their internal organs on these really physically fit animals because they had them on an exercise routine. And they did the analysis before and after the physical exercise, and also following the injection of cancer into these mice. And what they found was that aerobic activity, 
was significantly reducing the development of metastatic tumors in the lymph nodes, in the lungs, in the liver. Well, well there's something going on here. So the results showed that as much as 72% less metastatic cancer was seen in participants who reported regular aerobic activity, but it had to be high intensity. And that was compared to those who did not engage in any kind of physical exercise. So what they posited is that high intensity aerobic exercise is increasing the internal organs consumption of glucose. It's a sugar, it's not fructose, it's glucose. And that is decreasing effectively the amount of energy that is available to the tumor. So a positive effect like this is similar to impact of exercise on other conditions. And we've known this, conditions like heart disease and diabetes. So they're saying there's nothing new about the concept, but now there's data that's following that up. So why, why is that happening? Well, they're saying that there's a rise in the number of glucose receptors in the membranes, on the membranes of cells during high intensity aerobic activity in all of these body cells. And what that is allowing is an increase of glucose to get into those cells because the receptors on the membranes, the glute receptors and others are allowing the glucose to get in and it's turning the cells and those organs into effective energy consumption machines. This is a quote, by the way, from the authors of this study, very much like you see in muscles. So the assumption then is that organs are competing for sugar resources with the muscles, which we know burn large amounts of glucose during physical exercise. And if cancer develops, there is a fierce competition over glucose, which reduces energy availability to those cancer cells. And that energy is, is critical to metastasis. If there's no energy, you're going to get a lot of less metastases. And remember, met metastases is the spread of that cancer from the initial primary cancer area to the rest of the body. So when a person is exercising regularly, this condition, which is like a strong organ like muscles, it becomes permanent. That organ is now a high intensity energy machine. And therefore we posit here that exercise changes the whole body so that the cancer cannot spread or has a lot less trouble spreading. And the primary tumor will also shrink in size. So the results are indicating that unlike fat burning exercise, which is normally relatively moderate, we're talking here about high intensity aerobic activity. And it's that that's helping in cancer prevention. For example, if the optimal energy range for burning fat is 65 or 70% of a maximum pulse rate, the sugar burning, which is required is at least 80 or 85%, even if it's only in brief intervals. So for those of you who do exercise, you know that you can do brief interval, very high intensity aerobic activity. That's what we're talking about. So the results are suggesting that healthy individuals should also include high intensity components in their fitness programs. And a look at the future. The conclusions here is that future studies will enable personalized medicine for preventing specific cancers with physicians reviewing family histories to recommend the right kind of physical activity, if it's possible. And physical exercise with its unique metabolic and physiolog physiological effects exhibits a higher level of cancer prevention, interestingly enough, than any medication or medical intervention to date when you do it as an AB study. So the key takeaways, aerobic exercise makes some organs so efficient at grabbing sugar in the body that tumors are left starved of glucose and often unable to grow and spread. Secondly, high intensity aerobic exercise, which derives its energy from sugar can reduce the risk of some metastatic cancers by as much as 72%. And physical exercise with its unique 
metabolic and physiologic effects exhibits a much higher level of cancer prevention than, as I said earlier, for any medication or medical intervention to date. And that is our quick look at exercise and metastatic disease. And I just well, want to add one last thing to this. I want to, make, I want to make sure that everybody understands this. Don't misunderstand. You don't stop other treatment because now I'm going to exercise and that's going to stop metastatic disease. No, 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 no. You do everything you can to deal with cancer and its metastatic component. But this high intensity exercise should not be overlooked, folks. This is an important part. That's it. Fantastic. So a key takeaway for me is definitely that uh, our, our protocol, all lifestyle medicine really is being backed up by these wonderful scientific studies. This is another uh, uh, thing to add to the body of work that proves that our you know diet and rest and exercise and stress reduction supplementation program works. It's not designed specifically to treat cancer, of course, and you need to be under the, the um, uh, supervision of your physician on that because that can go south real quick. But we have a train, we call it HIIT training, high intensity interval training. And for those that aren't sure what that means, uh, it means you can only do it for a little while because you'd complete, you'd run out of breath. It's not aerobic training, which is actually sub aerobic. So you can keep doing that for a long time. Your body just gets good at it. It's high intensity enough to make you run out of breath and you can't do it for very long, maybe just a minute or two at the most. And so you're doing exercise really intensely. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, obviously, we want to thank Dr. Gonshore for coming up with these studies. And by the way, keep your suggestions coming because we are open to what you want us to talk about. And um, subscribe, like, and share if you enjoyed this episode. Uh, submit your questions, comments, and suggested topics to fdntraining.com slash science matters. And grab a copy of the studies that we are using in this series, fdntraining.com slash studies. And they're amazing. And don't worry about the big words. Uh, I struggle with them too. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why we have uh, AI, right, to help us understand. Um, it can take me three hours to read a study because I'm looking up everything. My, my favorite AI today is... Uh, called perplexity.ai that's a tip for you folks perplexity.ai is pretty much taking over chat gpt it's it's much better and i want you to join us again in two weeks on october 23rd when we'll talk about deep sleep brain waves and the regulation of daytime insulin sensitivity and glucose control i think you see a theme developing here and it's all because Science, Science matters. matters. <laughs>